returning him. But now the Tigers in maroon have field position in Swanee territory. And the first play of the game was a Justin Carmouche run. Justin Carmouche leading Trinity with 379 rushing yards on the year. What a season it has been for the senior who missed most of last year with an ankle injury. Now back in full fashion. Here he goes again. Nice little stutter step and look at him go. Justin Carmouche past the 10 into the end zone for a touchdown. Justin Carmouche kicks senior day off with a touchdown and what a run it was showing great patience and then bursting through for six yeah absolutely brian good good penetration from swanee in the backfield right away but a little stutter step out of carmouche just threw everything off opened up a hole for him and he burst through it really quickly turned on the jets and he got to the outside and he was gone no one was going to catch him from behind right there yeah the replay gives you an excellent look at it Swanee had a little bit of a beat on it, but they are unable to stop the senior. The confetti flies early in San Antonio as Blake Lynn makes the extra point. And maybe a little quicker than we thought, Luke, but the Trinity Tiger is on the board. Yeah, Brian, I know. I mean, we talked a little bit about it. Rush today more so than we would have liked to have been. But Tigers out on the field are ready for this game. Trinity responding very quickly after, after an onside kick, kind of, threw things off, but the offense took care of business, took advantage of really good field position, and Justin Carmouche on senior day getting the party started really early on. It's been a while since we've seen Trinity, three weeks now since we last hosted Barry, and the Tigers have been busy on the road. They defeated center in a big-time matchup up in Danville, Kentucky, and then a week ago, they blew the doors off of Millsaps, a 53-7 win in Jackson, Mississippi. So Trinity taking care of business on the road, remaining perfect in the conference, 9-0 overall on the season. The playoffs right on the horizon. And what a start it is for them against Swanee. Blakelin will kick it off now, not even a minute into this game. And the boys in maroon and white already ahead. The kickoff will be received by Swanee here at the 10 Nice coverage by the kickoff return team. Broken tackle initially there for Swanee, but eventually brought down near the 25. And it'll be the first we'll see of the Swanee offense, and we'll see who it'll be. It's been a little bit of a quarterback carousel for the Swanee Tigers, and they have yet to take the field here. Tiger defense ready to go. And first glance it looks like it will be number 13 Chris Phillips at quarterback the freshman from Clarksville Tennessee he was two for eight a week ago 38 yards and his first career touchdown as Swanee lost to Barry but the freshman getting the go here he will hand it off and you might hear that a lot hand it off the Swanee Tigers love to give it to their running back Michael McGee and his counterpart Demarion Wigginton but that first run, not going anywhere, Luke. And this Trinity defense, one of the most prepared when it comes to the running game. Yeah, absolutely. Top five across about 240 D3 institutions participating in football, averaging or giving up only about an average of 50 yards or fewer in the run game every single week. And it starts up front with this defensive line. It's a little bit of a different unit than it was last year, a little bit more speed on the edges, but in the middle right now, you see Amir Mustafa is just not at all being moved by this Swanee offensive line, creating a lot of traffic up there. And right now, it's these defensive linemen that are cleaning up the mess. Usually, we see these linebackers come free. But early on, a couple plays into this game, those four up front looking really, really strong to start it. And seemingly, everybody who steps in there for the defensive line just continues to get the job done. They are without some of their prototypical names that we were used to at the beginning of the year. Michael Jewett, not currently in there. Harris Good has been dealing with injuries as well. Coach Urban just saying it's been one of those years, really banged up from start to finish. But they have been trying to deal with it. And there is a sack from one of the guys who has stepped up. Max Shillstone gets the quarterback behind the line of scrimmage. And a three and out for the Trinity defense. Yeah, Ryan, this one is a coverage tack. At the end of the day, Phillips has a ton of time in the pocket, begins to step up, maybe steps up just a half second too late as Shillstone was on that little stunt, but came back into the middle, 
was able to wrap him up for the sack. So a great start this afternoon. Justin Carmouche getting it going, finding the end zone. This Tiger defense stepping up and causing that three and out right away. And here goes B.J. Stewart. Look out. B.J. Stewart has blocks ahead of him. And he has his roommate, B.J. Rainey, and he's into the end zone for six. B.J. Stewart back and better than ever. And we are three minutes into this afternoon. And the Trinity Tigers running all over Swanee. Yeah, Brian. And it wasn't a terrible punt. It was actually a quite good one. Nice spiral with the wind at his back, but it was a little bit too low of a line drive kick. And he might have outkicked his coverage a little bit. B.J. Stewart had that one really quickly, and those lanes were open. You see Caleb Harmel pointing towards the end zone, calling the shot for the Tigers right there. And that extra points through the upright. So three minutes into this one, and Trinity has come out looking to make a statement. 9-0 coming into this week. We've already mentioned it a couple times, but looking to solidify a playoff bid to host, not just participate this year. Last year, they got sent on the road despite a perfect 9-0 record, but trying to finish things off right, put the icing on the cake, and just cement a game next year in, here next week in San Antonio. And what's so fun, Luke, is we've gotten to cover this team so closely for a couple of years now that we just start to notice things as they happen, and that Caleb Harmel pointing... I mean, he had to still be 30 yards away from the end zone, and yet he was already celebrating and loved to see B.J. Rainey there again, just like B.J. Stewart's first punt return touchdown. It is B.J. Rainey, the fellow sophomore, and B.J. Rainey and B.J. Stewart becoming known as the Scooter Boys around Trinity because of how they ride their scooters around campus, getting it done again. So 12 minutes left in the first quarter, and the Trinity Tigers up 14-0, and when Coach Urban said they wanted to play Tiger brand of football, I think this is what he meant. Yeah, absolutely, Brian. It's what we've seen out of this team all season long. An emphasis in the special teams game, a really, really great job of hitting the home run plays. I can't count the number of times we've seen these big 20, 30-yard rushing touchdowns get broken off. But those are some of the most important aspects of the game. It's the way you win. It's going to be interesting to see how they play the rest of this afternoon, already up 14 nothing here just a couple of minutes into the game. How do they settle in? What things are they going to work on and sharpen up as the afternoon continues? But right now, wind really taking a toll, playing a factor as on this near sideline out of the image of the screen. The medical tent is getting blown away a little bit, and that ball hanging up in the air just falling straight back down directly down you're exactly right Luke that one just reached the 30 and plummeted the wind is seriously howling here in San Antonio the first taste of winter weather that we've had I mean you might look at the screen and you might say well it's beautiful don't see a cloud in sight perfectly sunny but as we mentioned at the top it is in the 50s in the Alamo City we're not quite used to it wearing long sleeves and pants all around people have their jackets out even see some beanies, because we are not that strong here when it comes to the cold. But let's see what Swanee can do to respond. It is still Phillips back there. His lefty throwing motion out to his receiver will not be caught. Henry Arnall, the intended target, and it'll bring up a second and 10 for Swanee. Had a nice play right there to get it started on first down. The blocking up front was really good not a whole lot of pressure looks like they were double teaming shillstone on the near side wasn't able to use his speed to win there and just a nice little comeback route to try and get three or four yards on first down but when you're playing against this defense when you're down 14 nothing already you can't afford to have drops like that when you have the chance to pick up small gains play action phillips looking to osa and there is the cornerback malik ross that's the ball away and brings up a third and 10. Malik Ross and Trey King, the two Trinity cornerbacks who going back to a year ago, shutting opponents down, and they continue to do so in the last two games. They have both had interceptions. And Malik Ross's interception really could go down as one of the sneaky plays that saved the season. As you get a look on your screen, the wind blowing the Trinity flag 
third and ten. Tigers bring pressure, and Phillips has nowhere to go. Mac Douglas and James O'Gunnerin, the combo. But there was a whole lot of maroon as Swanee again will go three and out. Yeah, you mentioned a couple guys on that one, Brian. Some half sacks going to be handed out, but it's close to giving out quarter sacks if that was possible for Tigers wrapping up the quarterback right there, sending him just a little bit further back. Another fourth and long is going to be a punt, and you're going to have to see how this one plays out. They're going to kick it to B.J. Stewart again. It looks like that's the case. This punt even a little bit better, but still a lot of green grass out there, but the coverage really solid that time. Definitely a lot better for Swanee. And just to wrap up that little point ahead of the sack, Malik Ross had an interception in the game against center. And Trinity fans, if you were watching, you might remember that Trinity was down 14-0 on the road against a center team that could have won out and won the conference. Instead, right ahead of the half, Malik Ross had a over 60-yard interception return for a touchdown that put Trinity ahead heading into the locker room and really changed the momentum and so we mentioned those plays at the top of the broadcast, that blocked extra point, that miracle play against Birmingham Southern. Those will get the headlines, but that Malik Ross interception could go a long way into clinching the crown. And here, Tucker Horn with his first pass of the afternoon. Hard to believe with the Tigers already up 14-0, but it's a completion to his favorite target, Ryan Merrifield, and it'll be a Trinity first down. Yeah, and really interesting right there. We see Ryan Merrifield sink down into those little openings, those bubbles in the zone. Usually we don't see it happen three or four yards beyond the line of scrimmage like it did right there. So impressive to see him turn that one into a 12, 13-yard gain, even when he had Swanee Tigers surrounding him from the get-go. Another pass, this time a completion to B.J. Stewart on the outside, but it'll lose yardage. Second and 12 coming up for Trinity. Ryan Merrifield needs one more catch for what would be a milestone, so we'll keep a close eye on that. Surely he'll get some more targets as B.J. Stewart walks off the field. Horn joined by Hutchison in the backfield. And you've got Caleb Crawford coming into motion and a sight for sore eyes there in the slot, Luke. Austin Burtness, the super senior wide receiver from Richmond, Texas, in there as Horn guns it to Merrifield off of his hands and incomplete. But what a welcome sight that is to see Austin Burtness back on the field. Yeah, Brian, and I don't know if you had been watching me for about the past 60 seconds, but after I saw the replay on that little bubble screen to B.J. Stewart, I saw that number two on the screen was looking through my notes, trying to figure out who it was, and then was trying to figure out if that was really out Austin out there on the field. Haven't seen him since the week one matchup here against Sol Ross State. A huge, huge aspect of last season's success in the passing game. So great to see him back out there. Looks like he's moving quite well. But right now, looks like on that throw to the outside, all the way across the field, into the wind that's blowing directly into the face of Tucker Horn, impacting this ball just a little bit, comes out of the hand a little bit wonky. You can see the spiral really break up, and it's going to impact the receiver at that point of the catch right there. Nice job by Tyler Wright, the senior from Alpharetta, Georgia, to be there when Crawford couldn't initially haul it in. He was able to knock it out of his hands. And it'll bring out the punting unit for Trinity. The first time we've seen Eli Gaiman. And that ball just hanging up in the air. It'll bounce right along midfield. And that's where Suwani will get it. We'll take a quick timeout and be right back on Tiger Network. Welcome back. In Division 3, we have quick timeouts, no commercials to bring you. So Chris Phillips, back to pass, and he just has nothing going for him right now. Make it another sack for Trinity as the maroon and white just all over Swanee right now. 
Looks like it was Braden Ensley. First time we've called that name this year. Just no resistance right now, Luke. Yeah, absolutely. And it looks like there's a lot of issues right in the middle of that offensive line. Previously, we saw, and I mentioned, Amir Mustafa, who was just creating a lot of traffic, a lot of buildup, weren't getting good push against the big 5'10", 5'11", 6 foot, but probably 300 pounder out there. On those last couple of plays, though, a lot of pressure's been in the backfield because of the get off, the quickness of some of these other nose tackles that have come into the game, and already just seven minutes, a little bit less than gone here this afternoon, and multiple sacks from this defensive line. One of the biggest changes that we've seen from the defensive line that this Trinity defense put out last year versus the one they bring out here this season every single week. A lot more speed, a lot more pressure trying to get to the quarterback. And for the most part this year, they've been immensely, immensely successful. And you see that it creates situations like this where Swanee is now way behind the sticks, about a third and 25 right here. Not many plays in the playbook for this down in distance. And that won't get them there. A pass that rolls out of bounds. Might have been a backwards pass, and it was. The referee spotting it as a loss of yardage. So it'll be fourth down and 23. And Chris Phillips just unable to connect with much here. He was going for the little sling pass out there. Dagum Samuel, the junior from Nashville, Tennessee. But instead, it'll be another Suwannee punt with B.J. Stewart back to receive. And B.J., way way back within his own 20 yard line right now even though this ball is going to be snapped from the 25 really factoring in the wind playing at the back some nice punts some nice spirals that we've already seen but that one's going to come off the foot awkwardly and take a nice bounce along the sideline but they're going to say it hit the white right around the 40 yard line so better than a bj stewart touchdown but a little bit of an unlucky break with that one just tiptoeing along the sideline and ending up in the white and as the Tiger offense for Trinity takes the field again, we have to update a statement that we were so excited about. And not that we're not excited about who is on the field, but it does turn out that number two today is Ethan Boyer. A good catch by you, Luke, as he came out to the sideline. So it does look like Austin Burton is still not there. We're so used to seeing his number two and immediately thinking Austin Burton is. And Ethan Boyer typically wearing number three. But for some reason, we don't know, he is wearing number two today. And so, sorry to report that Austin Burton is, is not back yet. But we are very happy to see Ethan Boyer, who had a career-high three receptions, 82 yards last week, and a touchdown. And he's played a pivotal part late in some of these games, Luke. Yeah, absolutely. Kind of just circumstantial. He's come in when some of these ones and twos have needed breathers. But any opportunity that Ethan Boyer has had, he's made the most of Brian I remember very clearly as Trinity was driving towards this north end zone earlier this year he came in on a third down third and 10 and won on a jump ball a huge huge play that kept the offense rolling it resulted in a touchdown but it wouldn't have been a possibility if he wasn't out there and wasn't making that type of play he's someone that works incredibly hard in every aspect of the game especially especially important at the wide receiver position right you see the routes run but you don't talk a whole lot about these guys in the blocking game on the outsides. But he does a really, really good job along with everyone else. It's been a theme of the year. Wide receivers stepping up when it matters most. After that last play, Parker Ray, a senior from Columbus, Mississippi, a little slow to get up. He's off the field now. And Tucker Horn, first and 10 in Swanee territory. Five wide receivers looking to Caleb Crawford who hauls it in and spins around for a first down. But whether it's Caleb Crawford, whether it's Ryan Merrifield, I mean, we could go down the depth chart on the wide receiver position. Of course, Carter Self with that amazing touchdown against Birmingham. These guys coming through for the likes of Austin Burtness, who has not played since that first game. And it seems like every week we have a new hero at that position. Yeah, absolutely, Brian. And it's so interesting in the scheme of this offense that it's not just these wide receivers who are making the ball, making the plays in the passing game. So we see Tucker Horn throw on that double move, connecting again with number 19 out there. Great timing on that play. We've seen it a couple of times where Tucker Horn 
turns his back fully to the defense on that fake handoff, allows things to really unravel, and another nice double move on the outside right there from this Trinity receiving core. Caleb Crawford finding himself wide open. But it's not just the wide receivers. These running backs get involved on those little swing passes. It gets them at full speed attacking the outside, and they've just been immensely, immensely successful. And it's the same scenario where it's not just one of them making a difference. Every single week, all three of these running backs right now, Grigsby with some nice shiftiness as he attacks the interior of that offensive line, finding a hole up the middle and turning it into a seven-yard game. But it's Grigsby, Hutchison, who's gotten healthier and healthier as the season's gone along. And, of course, we've already called Justin Carmouche's name. So three guys in that positional group that all have made huge differences this season. Absolutely. The numbers back up what you're saying. Carmouche leading the way with 379 rushing yards, but Grigsby right there with 366. And then Hutchison at 218, but a week ago led the way with 72 as he kind of catches up for lost time. He missed some games with an injury earlier in the season, but now really a three-headed attack in the backfield for the Tigers. Here it'll go to Grigsby looking to make something happen, but he'll be brought down by Tucker Kirk, the junior from Dallanaga, Georgia. Picked up his first tackle of the season last week against Barry in Swanee's loss, and he comes up with the stop here. So third and one upcoming for Trinity. And Tucker Horn, joined by legend Grigsby, looked at the sideline, set up the play, and they'll have Caleb Crawford as the lone receiver at the top of your screen. But watch out for Baylor Jordan there. Had his first career touchdown at that kind of tight end position that doesn't get a lot of targets. So we'll see what's up. Crawford coming in closer right behind Jordan. It'll be a run for Grigsby. Grigsby breaks through, and he'll have enough for the first down at the three-yard line. Yeah, and really interesting to see that offensive formation right there. Obviously highlighting Baylor Jordan, who caught his first career touchdown. Definitely a possibility in this area of the field. This is probably where this offense has struggled the most. They've hit the home runs. The special teams units have helped them out in the field position game, but when they've got down into this compressed area of the field on offense, we've seen them stall from time to time. But I like this idea, going with the big guys up front, trying to push the ball. That one, a <laughs> good thought right there. Again, going to Crawford. But the wind, I think, continuing to play a little bit of a role. Tucker Horn trying to throw that one up over the top, but that one ultimately falling incomplete. Now second and goal from about the four-yard line. I like that thought on the third down. Use the big guys up front. Use those extra bodies with your tight ends. Establish this run game in the red zone because you know you're going to need it for the rest of the season. Ryan Merrifield back out there now, joining Crawford as receivers. Legend Grigsby in the backfield. That play action nearly connecting. Horn had his options. And he'll try to do it again on second and three. He's back to pass. Grigsby, wide open, brings it in and jogs into the end zone for six more. Legend Grigsby sends the confetti flying again. He hauls in a receiving touchdown, showing what the former receiver can do. Making it look easy on the outside and putting Trinity up 20-0 to zero with an extra point pending. And... Just another great drive from this offense. A couple of times that we've seen it this afternoon. Just everything working early on this afternoon. The running game has looked good. Good push up front. But these running backs have been equally as impressive doing their job. Being patient to let these holes develop and then hitting them hard when they appear. And then these receivers, of course, running good routes to start the game. Settling down into zones. Tucker Horn been on time. Delivered some strikes. Obviously, the wind playing an impact here this afternoon, but everything's looked good. A little over 10 minutes into the game, and it shows on the scoreboard 21 0, the Trinity Tigers leading the Swanee Tigers here in San Antonio. And we've officially now called Legend Grigsby, BJ Stewart, and BJ Rainey. And if you're keeping track at home, those are the three members of the Tiger football team who were on that record breaking track team. It sure must be nice to have some speed there on the field. And these Tigers certainly utilizing every ounce of that. 41.15 seconds, the Trinity record that was broken 
during last year's track and field championship. Rainey, Stewart, and Grigsby on that relay team. And it sets up another Blake Lynn kickoff, but it looks like you'll have to have a holder again because that wind is just playing all sorts of fits here. So we'll do it the old-fashioned way. Just a beautiful day in San Antonio. If you ask me, this is exactly where it needs to be and exactly where it needs to stay. It doesn't need to be much colder. We don't need snow. We don't need clouds. But we also don't need 100 degrees and humid all the time. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right about that one, Brian. Again, the wind playing a role this afternoon. The return man for the Swanee Tigers back there is their running back, Demarion Wigginton, who I think lost that one in the sun as it was held up in the air and it fell to the ground. You see it happen at the last second, just a couple yards away from it. And he falls on it pretty harmlessly, but going to set the Swanee Tigers up in bad field position, especially the way that this defense for Trinity has played early on in this game. They've only driven them backwards. So right around the 10-yard line is where Swanee will start. Chris Phillips will give it another go. He'll hand it off to Michael McGee, and McGee... Not going anywhere. The senior from Chattanooga, Tennessee, with over 770 rushing yards this year, is second in the SAA. He's had a spectacular year and is a go-to weapon for this Swanee offense. But so far today, three attempts for a combined one yard as he gets a little taste of how difficult this defensive front is for Trinity. Phillips calls a man into motion, Arnall. And it'll be a play action. And there is a catch from Jose Osa. It'll be a first down for Suwani. And the chains can move the first reception for the sophomore from Mexico City, Mexico. Saludos a todos viendo el juego de la Ciudad de México. Osa from Mexico City, just like I am. I was able to communicate with him before the game, have a cool story about him and how he got to Swanee that we'll tell in a little bit. But that time, the sophomore bringing in the reception for the first down. So Swanee trying to build a little momentum, hand it off to McGee, but McGee is hauled down from behind. Yeah, now this Swanee offense trying to do some different things. That last throw, the first connection of the game with Osa, Trinity pressure was in the backfield again. Phillips just able to get the ball off. These cornerbacks playing back just a little bit. Enough of a cushion, even though Trey King got there as the ball did. But Osa doing a nice job to hold on to it, haul it in with that last running play, trying to get outside the tackles. Still not going anywhere as these linebackers beginning to show off their speed and continuing to get into the backfield is pretty much all of this Trinity defense. Still some new faces in there just continuing to be rotated in, but they're all finding success. Quite a dangerous spot to throw it in between Malik Ross and Casey Hampton over there, and it brings up a third and 12. Swanee with Chris Phillips as the quarterback, really on their fourth quarterback of the year. If you look at their season, they were led by Jeremiah Young, the sophomore from Boca Raton. He had over 600 passing yards, five touchdowns this year. But he did not play last week against Barry, not in there today. And Phillips giving it his best shot into double coverage, intending to reach Osa. But the pass will not be there. And the Trinity defense led that time by Trey King. Stand strong again. And the punting unit will continue to be busy. Jack Satterfield, sophomore from Murfreesboro, Tennessee, will come out as you get a look at this replay. Trying to connect with Osa again. Had a little bit of an opening there, but Trey King shutting it down quickly. Yeah, Brian. Obviously, we're going to talk a lot about this front seven, this defensive line getting home, the linebackers with a ton of speed, and B.J. Rainey almost getting there, maybe getting a little bit of a touch on that kick as it takes an awkward trajectory, but it will ultimately be down by the Swanee Tigers. 
But you talked about Malik Ross, Trey King coming up big on that third down right there. They are equally dangerous in the secondary secondary for this Trinity defense. They just don't get talked about as much because this Tiger unit is so good at stopping the run. And I think they established that so early on that teams have a difficult time moving to throwing the ball through the air. But when it is, it's always dangerous. I think Phillips certainly has to be cognizant of it. We saw a little bit of a hitch, a little bit of hesitancy to throw, and it created a bit more pressure, a bit more congestion around Osa ultimately with three Tigers in the secondary out there. So it's certainly going to be something to watch as the game continues. Are they going to be comfortable throwing towards those cornerbacks on the outside? Because both of them are incredibly confident right now. Coach Urban said Malik Ross and Trey King have continued to stay locked in especially as more teams just are really forced to go up against them because the Trinity run defense is so stout that teams have to find a way to get yardage somehow. And so the targets have been those cornerbacks, but King and Ross responding incredibly well. Trinity now back on offense. Tucker Horn completing a pass to the outside, but it loses yardage to BJ Stewart. So it's second and 12. A little pitch to the outside. Carmouche making some nice moves again. Gets some decent yardage but it will bring up a third and long. We got to catch you up on some history. After that last touchdown, Tucker Horn completing his 60th touchdown of his career. Now tied for third place all time in Trinity history, tying Dan Desplaines. So third all time in Trinity history, four touchdowns, Tucker Horn. And with one more, he'll be alone in that spot. So the senior quarterback from Graham, Texas, just continues to stack up the milestones. We have a feeling he might get one or two more today. So keep a close eye on him. He steps back to pass, goes to his outlet, Carmouche. Carmouche with a nice stiff arm, but it won't be enough to get to the chain. So what could be the last play of the first frame will be a stop for Swanee just ahead of the sticks, fourth and one. And would be very surprised to see Trinity go for it here. But you really never know, do you, Brian? The things that Coach Urban pulls out of his pocket, especially when he's going to have some time to think about it, and this Trinity offense is going to let the clock hit zero, and they'll snap the ball on fourth down on the other side of the break. Couldn't have drawn up a better first quarter if you're the Trinity Tigers looking to lock up an undefeated regular season and they jump out in front 21-0, 14-0 before Tucker Horn even threw a pass. And Luke, you alluded to it a little bit earlier, trying to become the first team in this century to go back-to-back -back undefeated regular seasons because the last time Trinity did it, it was a three-peat, 1997, 1998, and 1999. Those were three years in a row that the Trinity Tigers went undefeated in conference play and in regular season play. And Coach Urban talking to us this week about just how special it is and how much it means to this team to know that they could go down into the history books. Yeah, absolutely. And when you circle the years that they've had back-to-back, -back, I think you can circle some pretty big games in that span, some really difficult contests that they had to play to get there. They certainly weren't given the opportunity, the easy path to these undefeated seasons. Last season, they had to go into Birmingham Southern to win a conference championship. This year, they defended their home turf against a top 10 team in Wheaton, did the same against Birmingham Southern, who gave them their absolute best shot and went down to the wire. So for this team, to come out in back-to-back -back years and have the chance to have zero losses in the column by the end of the year. And now, as we mentioned before, Coach Urban always with something in his back pocket. Thinking back to last year, Brian, it's exactly what I had in mind. Caleb Harmel on this special teams unit, getting the direct snap, a ton of green grass out in front of him, kind of kind of slowed up right there. I think he was trying to go back to his high school quarterback days, make some people miss in the open field, but I think he was trying to get in the end zone certainly right there, and we talked to him about it next week. He might be, might be a little bit disappointed, but we'll see on the replay right here. Straight to him, great blocking on that edge, 
creating that seal for him. And he was out there striding a little bit of high step right there. Not able to make the man miss, but setting up the Tiger offense again in great field position inside the Swanee 35. You never know what you'll see on Tiger Network. Caleb Harmel with the fake punt conversion to keep Trinity's drive alive. And I cannot wait to talk to Caleb about that because earlier in the year when he won Defensive Player of the Week, he won it at the same time that B.J. Stewart won Offensive Player of the Week and got to interview both of them and asked B.J. Stewart if he thought Caleb could be as good of a receiver as he was. And the answer was pretty positive. He said he thinks Caleb does have the hands, but now Caleb looking like a full-fledged running back. I mean, you said high-stepping it along the turf. He's got some speed there. Absolutely, Brian. And I think it is one of the lesser known facts, something that I was not aware of until Coach Urban informed us in our meetings earlier this season. But Caleb Harmel was quite the high school quarterback, right? Had, I think, 10 plus offers at the Division three level to play quarterback, including the University of Mary Harden Baylor, which is one of the top Division three programs in the country. He had an offer even from Harding University in Arkansas, which is one of the top Division II universities. But the only offer on the board to play a different position was here in San Antonio. Trinity offered Caleb as an athlete, and the rest is history for an All-American linebacker who is still finding the way to make plays with balls in his hand. Unbelievable. What a cool story, Luke, bringing us up to speed with Caleb's career history, leading the team in tackles this year, 55 of those, several of them for a loss. But he can do it all. Caleb Harmel, a senior from Burton, Texas, really adding on to this senior day vibe. We've got Tucker Horn throwing a touchdown. We've got Justin Carmouche scoring a touchdown. And Caleb Harmel, the latest to put success out there on the turf. And it brings up another fourth down. And Coach Urban... Coach Lytle not backing down. Five wide receivers for Tucker Horn. They look fully committed to going for it. Play clock down to one. And it snapped. Here we go. Horn looking right, looking deep. B.J. Stewart will not be able to bring it in. Nice defense there on the back end. Niles Harvey, the freshman from Dallas, Texas, with the tough task of defending Stewart. And Swanee comes up with a big stop on fourth down. Yeah, not a bad idea right there. I think Stewart just starting a little bit too close to the boundary or at least getting too close to the boundary early on. That ball is delivered and he doesn't have the opportunity to create the separation at the end. Great defense in the secondary just to stay right on that back hip. Doesn't necessarily have to get the head around. Played it really, really well right there. So... A good stop for Swanee, but Trinity certainly willing to go for it after they put themselves in good field position with that fake punt. The defense really not in any trouble right now, and fresh faces continuing to make appearances here this afternoon on Senior Day. McGee gets the carry here, and the fumble looks like it landed right in the arms of a Swanee Tiger and James O'Gunrin can't believe it. He thought they had forced a fumble. But John Luke Lassiter got the early Christmas gift here. You'll see the replay. McGee loses it. O'Gunrin had it. And then Lassiter ends up with it. So just a harmless run and a second and nine for Swanee. Yeah, Brian, you mentioned O'Gunran having the opportunity to secure that ball right there and maybe got to him a little bit quickly. Certainly wouldn't be expecting it in that scenario. But one of the trends that this Trinity defense has started to show in the past couple of weeks is their ability to get that football out. Don't think it's something we saw a ton early this season. Weren't super adept to picking the ball off a lot, weren't forcing the turnovers that we've seen the way they've done it in the latter half of this season. Obviously, we've talked about Malik Ross, a huge, huge pick six in that game against center, which really, really flipped the momentum. But James O'Gunran, a couple weeks ago, being honored by Division3Football.com, the national team of the week at the level, forcing a couple of fumbles himself. 
the way that this defensive line has started to attack the football, punching it out, stripping it, certainly very, very valuable to create extra possessions for the offense. And there is a gun run right there coming in hot after Ezra Gore forced Phillips to step up and immediately the rest of the Tiger defense was there to clean it up. I think the only reasonable explanation is he must have heard you talking about him, Luke. A gun ring just bursting through the line and bringing down Phillips for the sack. A gun ring first team all conference a year ago. We surely will find out those all conference honorees relatively soon. And would not be surprised to see another first team selection for number 52. The punt off. And Swanee dives on top of it. Trinity will start at their own 46. 21 to nothing, the score for the Trinity Tigers over Swanee. The University of the South, commonly known as Swanee, pulled off a couple of wins earlier in the year, which was a very welcome sight for them. They beat St. Scholastica and Westminster after a couple of seasons that saw them go winless the entire year. Have to believe the folks up in the mountains of Tennessee were thrilled to see their purple and white get in the win column. But they're still looking for their first victory in SAA play. BJ Stewart gets the catch here on the side, gets a nice yardage, and will bring up a second and medium. But the Swanee Tigers have not won in conference play since way back in 2018 when they defeated Rhodes. They did not win in 2019. They did not really play a 2020 season because they opted out of that shortened spring season, only played really what was an exhibition, and then they went winless again in 2021 and have not won in conference play this year. So they're looking to get things back in the right direction. Swanee led by head coach Travis Rundle, who's in his sixth season here as head coach. And I know you and I, Luke, both paying very close attention to D3 football across the nation today. And I wonder if Coach Rundle will also be keeping an eye on his alma mater, Albion College, who plays a winner-take-all against Alma later today. Yeah, Brian. I think a lot can be said about Division Three football and the way things have unfolded this season. Even here in San Antonio, we have had great games. We talk about the Wheaton College matchup as B.J. Stewart comes up with a fantastic snag right there. The defender just draped all over him, but he laid out flat and snagged that one. Certainly has the wheels. He's shown off his speed here today, but now understanding a bit better why he's out there playing wide receiver with hands like that. But things have been great early on across the Division Three level, but here this afternoon... About half of the automatic qualifiers have yet to be decided, and I think we have nine winner-take-all games taking place today. It should be a huge, huge, huge day of Division Three football. You have some great matchups like that. Also, St. John's and Bethel, a conference championship game, one of the few that get played at the level. But you mentioned Swanee, and you mentioned the fact that they've been winless in the SAA. And I think it speaks more to the just power of this conference and how impressive so many of the teams have been as it continues to trend in the direction of one of the top conferences in all of Division Three football. You have Trinity, you have Birmingham Southern, who has one of the best resume of all the Pool C at large teams this year. Barry, who won the conference for about five straight years. Center, who is played incredibly well against these upper echelon teams and certainly there's a little bit of a gap there but those teams like Hendricks and Rhodes and Swanee they've competed with each other and they're continuing to trend in the right direction so I'm sure it's only a matter of time before they break into that win column Brian. BJ Stewart off and running again he has dominated this drive gets another first down for Trinity and it is so nice to see B.J. Stewart back out there. We hadn't seen him in a while because he missed two games and a couple of them were here at home. You know, he was dealing with an injury in the middle of the season, but got back out there during the road trip. And fantastic to see number one out there, the sophomore from Shreveport, Louisiana, who has made his name well-known in San Antonio now. Yeah, 
and in that number one jersey wearing or taking that jersey from Chris Stewart, who was another speedster on this team, played in a similar role as Tucker Horn's going to be wrapped up and sacked behind the sticks. Two guys that are both certainly fast, but Chris Stewart, or excuse me, B.J. Stewart, with a different element to his game, that start-stop ability, which Coach Urban thinks is one of the best in all of Division Three. It allows him to do so many different things for this offense. Earlier we called his name streaking down the sideline on a vertical route, but we see the Tucker Horn, we see Tucker Horn just put the ball in his hands all the time. Just get it into the hands of your playmakers, a guy like him who can make people miss, who can turn on the Jets. We've seen him over the middle, on the outside, on these short bubble screens. Really, really impressive to see him. Just incredibly entertaining. Matthew Kovacevic running across the field. That crossing pattern working well for number 87. He, like Baylor Jordan, at that kind of tight end H-back position. Don't get a lot of looks, but they've made him count. He has five receptions for 52 yards coming into today, so make it six now on the year. And the sophomore puts Trinity in the red zone. Tucker Horn has all his weapons to work with. Will Taylor at the bottom of your screen. Caleb Crawford at the top. And Legend Grigsby in the backfield. It'll be Grigsby who goes left, sees some space, gets around, but is brought down. A nice tackle there on the outside to prevent him from going much further. You see the nice block by Caleb Crawford, Jordan, and Kovacevic there. The two aforementioned names trying to get there in time. But it was Swanee with the tackle. And it brings up second and seven. Horn goes to Taylor, and Taylor tries to come up with a fantastic catch on the sideline, but a great Defensive play again. These cornerbacks for Swanee when they've been pushed up against the end zone. And it is again Niles Harvey who was up against Stewart last time. And that previous tackle that we were trying to look everywhere for the name. And now I realized why it was. It was Harris Cravens. And the note was that he's typically number 17 when Swanee's in black. But when they're in their white jerseys, he's number 8. So want to credit him with the tackle. And it brings up a Trinity third and seven, five wide set. Who will Horn go to? Swanee sends pressure. Horn looking left and a disconnect as he looked to Merrifield. And Horn will come off to the sideline and Blake Lynn will come in for the field goal. Yeah, Brian, but already a couple of times here this afternoon, we've seen this offense opt to put the ball in the air even when they've been within this 20 yard line just continuing to stall in the red zone a little bit especially interesting right there on a third and seven you go completely wide not even utilizing someone out of the backfield like we see them do so frequently but a little bit more polishing for Blake Lynn who comes on and knocks that one through the upright it's certainly a welcome sight so Trinity takes the 24 nothing lead 5.15 left in the second quarter, and we're hoping this is just the beginning of what could be an absolutely magical day for the Trinity Tigers. Luke, I know you and I are pumped for what is to come. We're kicking things off with Trinity football here, and then at 5 p.m., I know we are going to head over, and we hope all of you who are listening or who are here will head over to Paul McGinley Field to cheer on the women's soccer team hosting Pomona Pitzer in the NCAA playoffs. And then we will all simultaneously get our phones out, get our laptops out, and tune in to Trinity Volleyball, who are playing in the regional final against the undefeated number one Claremont Mudscripts Athenas with a trip to the quarterfinals on the line. And those are just playoff games. We've got women's basketball playing against Millsaps out in Alabama. We've got men's basketball up in Rochester against a top 25 team. And we've got cross country out in the regional championships as well. It's almost hard to catch up with everything, but it is a great time to be a Trinity Tiger. Absolutely right about that, Brian, especially considering the fact that things got started yesterday, right? We 
talk about those games that are continuing, but volleyball now in the third round of the NCAA playoff. They won last night in fantastic fashion. Those basketball teams getting underway this season, but all three teams that played yesterday set a really, really high standard. Men's basketball team winning of winning by a margin of about 30 points, and the women's basketball team almost unbelievably putting up 140 points in their first game of the season. I mean, I was talking yesterday with our great sports information director, Harrison Lalone, and I'm texting him about the volleyball match, and he's like, wait, forget volleyball for a second. Are you seeing what is happening in Birmingham? And I go check the score, and I see that monster performance, the most game, the most points in any NCAA game in three years across divisions. Just insane. You want to know something crazy, though, Brian? It's not a stat that lasted for the Tigers for very long. Hope College, who won the national championship last year at the Division Three level, their game went final just a couple of minutes later, and they had to best the Trinity Tigers by just three points, putting up 143 of their own. So I think I know what that means. Cameron Hill, women's basketball, if you're listening out there in Birmingham, 144 or bust. It's that simple. Absolutely. And I know we've talked about it a lot, at least we did last year. We want the promos. We want the free giveaways. And we know the basketball teams last year were able to break that century mark a couple of times. Now that they've set the bar this high, I don't think they'll be scoring 140 very frequently. But I think it's a good introduction. It's a good way to get talks started for that giveaway that you want so desperately, Brian. I know. What in the world are we going to do if we're going to give out tacos at 100? What are we going to give out at 140? I know Trey King is partnered with the Ansira Auto Group. That, that came up in class the other day. So if there's anyone to talk to about promotional giveaways, Trey King is making a difference out there today. He might be able to make a difference in the conundrum we're stuck in right now. Trey King always up to something, isn't he? Last year in my presentation group for a sport philanthropy class did an excellent job helping us pitch to the San Antonio Spurs an idea on a tree giveaway. Still hoping to make it happen, but now he's sponsored by Ansira. I mean, Trey King does it all. and He's still out there, and look who it is. It's Trey King who gets in there on the tackle. Swanee had a second and six, tries to go to the outside. But John Luke Lasseter runs into the tree king himself, Trey King, to bring up the third down for Swanee. But before that, it'll be a penalty that'll back up the Tigers a little bit. And with 423 left in the second quarter, Trinity trying to keep that zero on the board for their opponent. We've seen this a couple of times. The Wildcat offense, McGee, in the backfield, taking the direct snap, and he fakes it on the sweep and takes it himself. But still not working very well for Swanee. Michael McGee just behind John Lewis of Birmingham Southern, who had a monster performance a week ago. If I remember correctly, over 340 yards, four touchdowns on the ground. We got to see him here. But he was another victim of this Trinity running defense. Only one opponent has been able to have over 100 yards against the Trinity defense on the ground. And right here, Trey King stopping at another pass intended for Osa on the outside. And it'll bring up fourth and 15 as Trey King, just as we decide to talk about him a little bit on this drive. Showing that he can do it on and off the field, Luke. Yeah, absolutely right about that, Brian. But you talk about that performance. Barry College being the only team that was able to break that century mark in the rushing yards category this season. This Trinity defense still only allowed seven points. Barry was able to end the game with 14 as we see B.J. Stewart again turning on the Jets and getting to the outside. Malik 
Ross with a great block right there. And Stewart staying in bounds and ultimately finding the end zone as he tiptoed down that sideline in great blocks ahead of him, just kept being made. And he found the end zone and he celebrates with the fans in the section on the track, making his rounds as he continues his run. A second return touchdown for B.J. Stewart this afternoon, and what a job it was. A man of the people, B.J. Stewart, make it two punt returns, four touchdowns, and this one had to be the hardest. The first two this year, he had a pretty clear lane, but look at him using his blocks, tiptoeing that sideline, and ultimately, six more for number one. You start to lose the words when trying to describe B.J. Stewart. And I love to see the new section utilized over there on the track. We've been waiting all year long to really see people gather over there. And I think maybe with how cold it is today, people having the need to move around a little bit, get their body flowing, because the stands are packed today. It is senior day, so many families on hand. But we've still got a nice little congregation of people out there on the track. And gosh, I just have visions of what that could look like next week if we host a playoff game in San Antonio, especially with some of the opponents who could end up coming. And they're going to be victims to so much confetti. Unfortunately, you can't see it on your screen, but every time Trinity does something positive, the confetti flies. Maybe can you get a look at it there? You can see a little bit of it on the way right there if you're paying close attention to the confetti there in the stands. But they've got to be stocked up. For 31 points in the first half. What a performance so far by the Trinity Tigers. Coach Urban telling us. And there you see some more remnants. Thank you. Great camera work. And to everyone in the control room for getting us. And getting you at home the look at the confetti. We're sure there will be more. But 31-0. to zero, Coach, Ur Coach Urban saying. We want to play Tiger brand of football. We want to execute at a high level. And we want these seniors to have a ring that says 10 and 0. And they look well on their way to getting that. Yeah, you're absolutely right about that, Brian. And you mentioned the fact that there's a lot of fans out here in San Antonio this afternoon. As that one's going to be returned from just inside the five-yard line. Swanee will again start within their own 20. But there's a lot of people out here in San Antonio. Currently, there's... A Tiger down on the field, so the training staff will make their way out there to the opposite side of the field. I think we'll go ahead and take a break while that player is down here in San Antonio. Cade Rapson, the injured man for Trinity, but good to see him walking off on his own power. Cade Rapson has done an excellent job this year filling in for some of those injuries we talked about. And hopefully he will be okay heading to the medical tent as Swanee returns to action. One of the better bursts we've seen up the middle for Michael McGee. Yeah, nice little hole on that right side of the offensive line. But for Trinity, those linebackers doing a nice job stepping up and filling. And you mentioned a nice burst, but one of their bigger runs up the middle today, and it's still just a three-yard gain is that one. To the outside, Trey King in coverage is going to be penalized right there for some pass interference. Six 
sí, eso parece que fue un poquito de interferencia. El pase a Jorge José Osa. José Osa, el único receptor que ha cachado un pase hoy. Y sí, es interferencia. And for those at home who do not speak Spanish, just saying that it does look like it was pass interference as Jose Osa was the intended target. Osa, the only receiver to haul in a pass today for Swanee. He's had a tough time out there dealing with Trey King, but that time he gets the better of it. A first and 10 for Swanee. Another handoff to McGee, and McGee breaks through the middle, gets a gain of two. Phillips continues to be back there. Talked about how he's really the fourth option for Swanee. Jeremiah Young starting the year at quarterback. Then Swanee went to Gray Nishwitz, the sophomore from Germantown. He had over 200 passing yards in several games this year. And then last week, Swanee went to Trip Richardson, sophomore from Kennesaw, Georgia. He went three for eight with 27 yards and a touchdown against Barry. But Phillips did also share some time with him, got a touchdown as well, and he has gotten the exclusive amount of playing time and a nice move from him, and he is upended but not before a first down for the freshman. Showing nice mobility there to move the chains and a second first down on this drive for Swanee. As you see this replay, nice patience using his blocks and making it past the first down marker, Trey King. There yet again. But it's a first down for Swanee. 120 left in the second quarter. Trinity still up 31 to nothing. And Phillips back to pass. And he's going deep. Osa will not bring it in. Double coverage. Trey King and Quinn McDermott. Pero Osa continúa ser un receptor popular. Continues to be a popular target. And he had a nice beat on it. But just unable to haul it in. So second and ten for Phillips and Swanee. Yeah, Brian, one of the biggest issues that this Swanee team's facing this afternoon, this offensive line just hasn't been able to get a great push, haven't been able to displace this defensive line in the opposite direction. But in that last run from Phillips, they did a good job of just staying engaged with their blocks, keeping hands on, keeping the feet moving. And Phillip was able, Phillips was able to make something happen himself, just finding an open running lane and getting into some open space. We've seen the Wildcat tried a couple of times, but just a little bit too quick things happening when the Wildcat's been employed. Some of these other plays from this Swanee offense just taking a little bit longer to develop, and it's let those lanes, or it's created those lanes that's led to some of these runs on this drive. So third and long here but it's going to be the same old story things just moving too quickly for this Swanee offensive line just a swarm of Tigers up the middle immediately before Phillips has the opportunity to do anything with the football it is sack number five for the Trinity Tigers and each one of them have been very similar in that almost from the get-go they are there in the backfield Looks like it was the first year Chase Campbell who had that initial pressure and helped bring Phillips down. But this defensive line, even more than usual today on this senior day, on this final regular season game, really rotating in and out. Coach Urban saying that he wanted to use some of his key reserves today. And a timeout ahead of a fourth and 19. Let's us take a beautiful look. I mean, come on now. The brand new turf at Trinity's baseball field. It's just sparkling, Luke. It was a beach earlier this season when we would take a look over there. And look what it has become. The T with the tiger in center field. The script tigers behind home. Can't wait for spring and for Trinity baseball. And such an awesome look. Talk about it all the time, but kind of different setup here in San Antonio. These facilities right in the middle of campus. 
campus right in the middle of downtown San Antonio. So some absolutely spectacular views as you see the highway up in that top left corner. You see as well the softball field in that top right corner, which got redone with turf as well. This stadium, which has been broken in over the past two years, still incredibly, incredibly new with the turf here with the new stadium on the home side. Just great, great updates here to the athletic facilities in San Antonio and just a special, special place to be. Special is the perfect word for it. So fortunate to have these incredible facilities, incredible staff at Trinity, and incredible teams to get to cover and report on week in and week out. Whether it's fall, winter, or spring, there are good things happening at Trinity University in San Antonio, Texas. And on this beautiful November day, Trinity will head into the locker room up 31-0 over Suwannee. It'll be a 20-minute halftime, and I urge you to not go anywhere because I promise you in the second half, Luke and I have some great stories for you. So even though the game is looking like a Trinity win, we will keep you engaged without a doubt. So take a break, get some food, get some drinks, and be back for the second half on Tiger Network. San Antonio Mayor.
I'm San Antonio Mayor. For more than 150 years, Trinity University has celebrated human inquiry. Our innovative curriculum is rooted in a distinctive blend of the liberal arts and sciences. Students and faculty hone creative curiosity by answering questions and questioning answers. In a supportive, interdisciplinary environment, they seek ways to build bridges and make connections. And with intentional meaning and purpose, they are driven by a sense of duty to themselves and to the world. Add in opportunities for undergraduate research, experiential learning, and nationally recognized pre-professional programs in business, communication, healthcare, education, and entrepreneurship, you get the full Trinity experience, the liberal arts plus. And while this experience may end with a Trinity degree, it's just the beginning of a lifetime of inspired exploration and perpetual discovery. I'm San Antonio Mayor Ron Nuremberg. I am a Trinity University alum, and I want you to know about my passion for these two vibrant communities. My alma mater is now a nationally recognized liberal arts university, offering fully integrated arts, humanities, STEM, and professional programs. Grounded in the liberal arts, Trinity graduates students who think critically, act meaningfully, and contribute confidently throughout their careers. As for San Antonio, Trinity is an oasis in the heart of a city that serves as a cultural bridge to the Americas. We are a diverse community that values inclusion and welcomes intellectual curiosity and spirited debate. We're a city that challenges convention and welcomes new ideas. Great things are happening at Trinity University in San Antonio and through all our connections to our multicultural world. Join me in being part of this exciting moment.
Welcome back to Tiger Network, where it's the Trinity Tigers defeating the Suwannee Tigers 31-0 after a first half that got off in a hurry. We know you may have missed the very, very beginning of the broadcast, so we'll recap that for you. Suwannee actually starting with an onside kick, trying to catch Trinity napping a little bit to start things off, but Trinity was all over it. And they drove right down the field just a couple of plays and had that Justin Carmouche touchdown. And as we come back from the half, Luke, what better of a day could we ask for in San Antonio? The skyline in the distance, another great look at the new baseball field, the outdoor pool. You see the softball field in the distance. And then finally, Paul McGinley Field, the home of women's soccer tonight for that NCAA playoff game. But it should be a fun second half. And based on what Coach Urban told us, maybe some new names that we'll see out there, don't you think? Yeah, absolutely. And Tucker Horn has been incredible to watch all season long, but Coach Urban said it in our meeting with him this week. It's been a long time since we've got the pleasure of watching Ryan back and watching the second stringers in this offensive unit. It's been incredibly, incredibly enjoyable when we see him out there because it's interesting to see how this team, how this coaching staff tailors to that different sort of fit but it'll be a moment as Swanee will get the ball to start the second half here and right now at least a lot of the same faces that we've been familiar with or got familiar with in the first half out there on the defensive side of the ball yeah if you take a look out there defensively I don't think I see very many starters I can Recognize Isaac Agumadu and Amir Mustafa there on the line. But other than that, it is almost completely the second unit for the Trinity Tigers as the first pass of the half goes to Osa. And Osa meets a couple of defenders back there, Quinn McDermott and Kennedy Stewart. Osa has been the go-to man. The only reception today, Chris Phillips, 1 for 10 passing in that one reception is Osa who steps off the field and have a neat story about Osa, the sophomore from Mexico City, Mexico. I'll tell it first in Spanish and then in English, so bear with me. Jose Osa vino de la Ciudad de México a Tennessee, Macaulay Boarding School. Me dijo que sus papás perdieron muchísimo en México después de un temblor. Esta jugada para por un penal. Va a trazar Suani un poquito, como cinco yardas, yo creo. Pero regresando a Osa, el temblor en 2017 en la Ciudad de México destruyó la escuela también de Osa, el tecnológico de Monterrey, a donde tenía un, una beca para estudiar y jugar fútbol. Entonces tuvo que venir a los Estados Unidos gracias a la escuela que le dio una beca para jugar aquí. Ganó dos campeonatos en high school y... Ya está aquí en Suani. And now in English, I will recap that. Jose Osa, a sophomore from Mexico City, Mexico, told me that in 2017, after there was an earthquake in Mexico City, his family lost so much and he lost much of his school. An academy in Monterrey, Mexico, completely destroyed by the earthquake, where he had an opportunity to play football, had a scholarship to play there, and so the McCallie Boarding School in Tennessee gave him a scholarship and offered him the chance to come to the United States to play football. He won two state championships as a starting wide receiver for McCallie, and now he is the star wide receiver here for the Swanee Tigers. So not often you see Mexico City, Mexico on a roster, Luke, when it comes to football, but a very unique background for Jose Osa that has brought him to the mountains of Tennessee. Yeah, Brian, and a really, really cool story. Very, very unique, right? One, to be in Tennessee at Swanee playing football, but also the way he got there. Certainly, certainly an awesome story just of persistence, perseverance, now just competing and being such a huge aspect of this team, of this offense on the football field. Really, really awesome. Really just impressed constantly by you and the connections you make and the stories that you get to tell here on the broadcast, Brian. So hats off, frankly. 
appreciate it, but I know both of us have gotten just such good opportunities to talk with these members of all the sports teams at Trinity U as the sports editor at the Trinitonian newspaper have brought up some great tidbits as well, and it just allows this broadcast to flow so well, I think. And we were talking a little bit at halftime about how when we first got started in some of these lopsided games, we would take timeouts. We wouldn't know what to talk about. But now we've both gotten to work, dug into our craft, and just work really, really hard to bring you these stories from both sides, from Trinity and whichever opponent is in town. So thank you to Jose for sharing that story. And hope that his family saw in the YouTube chat that they're tuning in live from Mexico City. So again, hello to them. Saludos a todos en la Ciudad de México. As Trinity back on offense after stopping Suwanee to come out of the half. And it is that name you mentioned, Luke. Ryan Back at quarterback for the Trinity Tigers. The sophomore from Austin, Texas. Someone who has drawn a lot of praise from head coach Jeremy Urban. Yeah, Brian, and we mentioned the fact that we haven't seen him a whole lot this season, especially here in the games played at home. You think about which contests were played here, obviously against Wheaton, the game that went into overtime. Tucker Horn was at the reins all of the time. Same thing in the game against Birmingham Southern when he led that game-winning drive, the game against Barry a couple of weeks ago. So it was really just the games early on this season against Texas Lutheran, against Sol Ross State that we saw Ryan out there. But you mentioned the level of praise that Coach Urban talks about Ryan Back. He's a guy that comes from an incredibly high level of football, playing at Vandergrift, one of the best districts in Texas high school football, playing against teams like Lake Travis and Westlake. He's a great athlete who played middle infield in high school when he was playing baseball. So he doesn't miss a beat. He has the arm strength. He has the legs that he shows off a little bit right here. But he also has decision-making that Tucker Horn does, just opting to throw that one away ultimately. So we'll see what Trinity opts to do as we continue to see them cycle in those running backs that were with that starting unit. Saw Winston Hutchison come out, get the first carry of this drive. Legend Grigsby out on the field right now, but it looks like there's an injured player down on the field for Swanee right now, and the trainers will come out to tend to him. Yeah, it looks like Michael Showalter... They're on the turf for Swanee, so we'll step away for a second and be right back. Showalter able to come off for Swanee on his own power. And it brings Trinity back out there. Receivers, Cole Monego, Will Taylor, Ethan Boyer, joined by Legend Grigsby in the backfield along with Ryan Back. It is second and 10, and a play action back has time. Guns it to Taylor, has some space. Taylor makes a move, and Taylor gets into the end zone for a touchdown. The sophomore quarterback to the freshman receiver makes it six more for Trinity and a great way for Ryan Back to come out of the half. Yeah, and just a really easy throw for Back to make right there. Outbreaking route, but a little bit of a comebacker and a ton of green grass. This one caught with defender not particularly close and it allows Anderson to make his man miss right here and ultimately get into the end zone for six to start off the second half. The extra point is good for Blake Lynn and Will Taylor, who came into today with 12 receptions for 181 yards and a pair of touchdowns, gets his third of the season. And when we talked about that receiver room earlier in the game, Will Taylor is one of those names that, in a conversation I had way back when, 
ahead of that Wheaton game with Austin Burtness, the super senior telling me that Will Taylor is going to be a special player. And when you hear that coming from the super senior receiver, you kind of take his word for it. And we've seen some great glimpses when Taylor does get out there on the turf. Yeah, absolutely, Brian. And it's been in more than just situations like this. A lot of the a lot of that unit, the wide receiver unit on the field for the Tigers, that possession, were those two and three string guys. But Will Taylor is a guy that we've seen get into the mix, even with first stringers, and be a viable option when he's out there with guys like Ryan Merrifield, Cole Manego, and the rest of the cast. But he has certainly stood out. He's made some really big plays, both in the offensive game, in the passing game, but also on special teams as well so certainly something to look forward to and just speaks numbers to the depth that this offense has kickoff for trinity caught by swanee right along the goal line and here comes the trinity coverage team but not covering very well here swanee makes some moves and they are across the 50 and to the 30 before being brought down at the 25 what a nice return for the Tigers in white and purple. Yeah, and it looked like the Tigers of Trinity were really flying around on that kickoff. Saw some people in the middle of that group get there with an opportunity to make a tackle, but just moving too quickly, not breaking down and chopping their steps, and it created some lanes right there for that Swanee return. But a nice job of the kicker. Tyler Weddle ultimately chasing him down on that right sideline and forcing him out to give this defense a chance to preserve this shutout that they're pitching right now. And credit Dagum Samuel, the junior from Nashville, Tennessee, as Phillips back to pass, looking deep and had a man if he hit him in stride. Ethan Gillespie, the freshman from Niantic, Connecticut, had a little bit of room there but will be incomplete. But going back to that return, we haven't heard the name of Dagum Samuel yet, which is surprising considering he does lead the team in receptions, 25 of them coming into today. He's been quiet on the offensive end, but making a little bit of magic on his own with that return. Swanee second and 10 from Trinity Territory. The handoff to McGee and McGee working his legs, grinding him into the ground, trying to get forward. Gets a couple of yards and brings up a third and eight for Swanee. Yeah, Brian. And one thing to note about Phillips this afternoon, when he's had the opportunity, had the time to get these throws off, he's had quite a bit of zip on the deliveries. Obviously not the accuracy that you would want, but a young quarterback playing this afternoon as a freshman has really come and stepped into this starting role late in the season. I think you have to like what you've seen certainly appears that he has the tools to have success. So certainly a bright spot and a bright future ahead for him and for these Swanee Tigers. And it's been a bright tenure for McGee, who gets through the middle and reaches the mark. Might be a little bit short, according to that spot, and he is. So it'll bring up the fourth down for Swanee, but they are not even hesitating they have not gotten on the board yet, and they are looking to convert on the fourth and one. 10-25 as the clock continues to tick in this third quarter, and Swanee will try to convert to get some points on the board. We'll see if the Tigers of Trinity bring a little bit extra pressure to try and stop him short, but it's going to be a stone wall right there, and based on that spot from the far judge, they're not going to grant that first down. A huge, huge stop. A great job from that defensive line up front, creating a lot of congestion and just no running lanes opened up. And you've got to love the excitement of all the coaches there on the sideline, primarily head coach Jeremy Urban and defensive coordinator Paul Mahalik. You see him on your screen. Paul Mahalik named the assistant coach of the year last year by the American Football Coaches Association in large part thanks to the defense that just absolutely wrecked their opponents. They had several shutouts a year ago. They've had one this year, but you can tell how much it would mean to them to keep that zero on the scoreboard. So surely we'll be working hard the rest of the game, and Ryan back again, gunslinger, out to Cole Manego 
for the first down. And a Swanee Tiger down in the backfield. As this Trinity offense just continues to roll even with the second team out there. And we'll take a quick break as Swanee will tend to their injured player. John Harbison able to get off the field with the help of his trainers. And the Trinity Tigers back out on offense of 38-0 and really making a statement trying to pitch this shutout. And Luke, you have a little bit for us on how the playoff picture might look for Trinity. Yeah, absolutely, Brian. And talking to Coach Urban this week, he put a lot of emphasis on performing in this game, making sure that Tigers came away with a victory, finished the season for a number of reasons with that perfect 10-0 record as we see Ryan back throw that one away on the sideline. But a big aspect of it is the fact that the committee, when choosing the field, is going to look at games like this. Shutouts are obviously incredibly important, but looking at the larger playoff picture at whole for everybody at home, breaking it down a little bit, Playoff will be made up of 32 teams, of course, with 27 automatic qualifiers. Those are the conference champions. That's what Trinity did this year to get into the playoff. And then after that, five teams will be selected out of a pool of many at-large teams that are all very, very deserving and very competent to make a run in the playoffs. What we saw last year when Birmingham Southern got in, was able to win a game, reach that second round, and be one of the final 16 teams standing. But one of the most important things to note is the fact that the committee is going to assign matchups or create matchups, at least in part created by geography and the cost of operating and running the championship. So two teams are going to face off in the first couple of rounds based off their geography more often than not when they're within 600 miles of each other. So it creates some skewed matchups sometimes. I think we saw it last year when I think everyone that's a fan of these Trinity Tigers was a little disappointed to be sent on the road into University of Mary Hardin Baylor playing on the road against one of the top five teams when Trinity ourselves were undefeated seem to have earned the opportunity to host a playoff game but things are going to look a little bit different this year Mary Harden Baylor obviously having lost the game is still an automatic qualifier in their own conference but the loss changes things based on what their resume looked like last year so a lot up in the air but a win like this today helps Trinity out either way perfect 10-0 record possibility of multiple wins against regionally ranked opponents all things that are going to help them out and looks like will give them really really good odds to host at least one playoff game this year it's exciting the possibility is there as ryan back with an incomplete pass there after the penalty brings up second and 11 but i think that point about geography is the one that just continues to stand out the most to me luke and when you think about geography you talked about Mary Harden Baylor and their status as champions of the American Southwest Conference. They did fall earlier in the year, so their resume is not perfect, but they're going to be in there. But the name that we've all been keeping an eye on here in San Antonio as Cole Manego gets that catch, gets about halfway through to what he needs for the first down. 
But the name is Harden Simmons. The Cowboys up in Abilene, a team that was left out of the bubble last year. Many thought they would be in. They thought they would be in with just one loss to Mary Harden Baylor. They were in the top 10, but they were not in. Just goes to show how tough that Pool C slotting can be. This year, though, they think their only loss came to Mary Harden Baylor. They defeated a Wisconsin Platteville team who has pulled off some nice regionally ranked wins. Those teams up there in Wisconsin, just an absolute gauntlet as Cole Manego, another catch for number three, gets the first down for Trinity. But a score that is very interesting for Cowboy fans and for Tiger fans is that Wisconsin Platteville is down 17 to zero in their matchup against Wisconsin Lacrosse right now. And Harden Simmons is not thrilled with that result if it stands because if Platteville goes down, that win against Platteville for Harden Simmons doesn't look quite as good. And it could be a second straight year that Harden Simmons is kept out of the playoffs. Now we won't know for sure until tomorrow, but they have not the strongest strength of schedule. They don't play many great opponents in non-conference play. And the reason we bring it up here is because if Harden Simmons were to get in, a lot of people do think that the Cowboys could make their way down to San Antonio. And if it's not them, then it could very well be the Crusaders of Mary Harden Baylor, Luke. Wouldn't that be something? Yeah, what a change. What a turn of events. Obviously, Trinity being shipped up the road last season. But you're right. Nothing has been decided yet. Harden Simmons, while they have a good chance, is ultimately relying on some other teams to come out and perform and to make their resume look a little bit better in the long run. But there's just so many moving pieces, Brian. If Harden Simmons doesn't get in, things are still different because a year ago, Birmingham Southern had just one loss to capture a pool C bid. But this season with two losses, probably not one of those five teams to receive an at-large bid. So you think about teams within Region 3, which includes Trinity, Mary Harden-Baylor, Harden-Simmons, you have to wonder what other teams will move up if they have the opportunity to get someone in from an at-large bid because there aren't as many automatic qualifiers. There are not as many conferences that are going to send a champion in Region 3. All the other regions have one additional conference, so it's something to keep in mind in regards to how it affects how many teams are going to be in the playoff and how teams get seeded or how matchups are created when geography is such a huge factor. Division three football is just a totally different world. If you aren't a part of it or weren't a part of it for a long time, you may think it's strange, but you kind of learn to love it over the years. And Trinity certainly trying to put themselves in the best spot for a playoff game on fourth and three. It's Manego again, why not? But Manego loses it as the ball spins out and he can't believe it as Swanee jumps on top of it in the end zone and will force a touchback. And an unfortunate chain of events there for Cole Manego. We'll see the replay, the fourth down conversion. He had it, he was running, but then ripped out as he was trying to gain some extra yardage. And that is no surprise for the Swanee Tigers. One of the most eye-popping stats as a team. I mentioned they haven't won a conference game. They've only won two games this year, but they have forced an SAA best nine fumbles. So that's number 10. And that's top 30 in the nation. So for whatever reason, the Swanee Tigers like to force those fumbles. And it was just a great job on that play, Brian, from the defensive back closing once the reception had been made, raking down and trying to get that football out. It was clearly very mindful, wasn't just going in to secure the tackle, but also made a conceded effort to get the football out to force that fumble. Unfortunate for the Trinity offense, for those guys that got out there on the field as second stringers, and certainly for Ryan Back, who has looked good on the throws that he's made this afternoon. A lot of time standing back there in the pocket, certainly different from the offense that we see Tucker Horn operate, but what Back has done so far has looked really good, been on time with a lot of those throws coming over the middle. That one just timed up perfectly, a really easy pitch and catch between him and Cole Manego. So 
certainly good signs from the Tigers that have come into the game this afternoon for Trinity. But on the other end, Swanee trying to take advantage of that forced turnover. It's Demarion Wigginton who's getting some carries now. He did well last week, actually leading the way for the Tigers with 51 rushing yards against Barry. He doesn't get as much playing time as his counterpart, Michael McGee, as we've highlighted how good of a season McGee has had. But Wigginton is a freshman from Garland, Texas. So the Lone Star State native making a return to Texas and trying to give his offense a little boost. Under four minutes remaining in the third quarter, Swanee still no points on the board. The defensive unit for Trinity, mostly guys that are on the second spot of the depth chart, if not deeper. And one name and number that stands out to me there, linebacker TJ Scannell, as Wigginton weaves his way past the down marker and near midfield for a first down. You can see Wigginton is feeling good. But mention the name TJ Scannell there, number 34, the first year from right here in San Antonio. And we showed the beautiful baseball field in the first half. And you might recognize that last name, Scannell. That is the son of Trinity baseball coach Tim Scannell out there. Scannell had his first career interception last week at Millsaps. And he's getting some more playing time. So cool to see the Scannells taking over more than just baseball here, Luke. Yeah, absolutely, Brian. And it makes you think of the other connections that we have between the baseball team and this football team. Immediately, the mind jumps to Ezra Gore, who makes an impact both on the field here, the gridiron, playing that kind of nickel safety position. We see him bring pressure off the edge so many times, but also a hard hitter for Coach Scannell on the baseball field. Just the impact that these athletes have across sports, across the campus, Brian. And there is Scannell with the tackle, but not before another nice gain of Wigginton, who moves those chains again for Swanee, one of their better-looking drives that started deep into their own territory after the fumble. But I think you're absolutely right, Luke. Scannell filling in at the linebacker position. That, as Rigor does, also happen to play. As a rigor, a first-team all-region Tiger on the baseball field. Earning his Defensive Player of the Week award in football this year. He is just everywhere. So as we've highlighted throughout the day, so many great things happening across sports at Trinity. And that connection between football and baseball, a strong one. Another carry for Wigginton. And he just continues to get it done. Positive yardage as he kind of limps off the field now. And it'll be McGee who comes back in. But the freshman getting it done for Swanee. Clock ticks under two. But they are looking to get on the board for the first time. And a good job in the secondary right there. That time number seven, Azariah Anderson coming across the field to... Wrap up Wigginton, bring him down. We've seen a couple of nice longer runs broken off on this drive. Looks like that one is going to be a delay of game. A false start actually on Swanee that will send them back closer to the original line of scrimmage. But a whole lot of fresh faces in there for Trinity right now. Even these second and third stringers along the defensive line not being pushed by this offensive line of Swanee. One of the biggest differences is just the way the linebackers are filling their spots right now. I think we see Caleb Carm or Caleb Harmel and James Gunner, and as that football is out, not entirely sure it was able to fall on it. Looks like it's going to stick with Swanee, so lucky right there to jump back on that football, but I think... With a gun run out there, Brian, with Harmel out there, we get kind of a little bit spoiled with the play of some all-American caliber linebackers who, even when they might fill the wrong hole, the wrong gap from time to time, they can recover with their speed. But it seems like some of these fresher faces, these younger players out on the field right now, are just going through the pangs of college football a little bit less experienced, certainly getting washed into some of these blocks near the line of scrimmage. 
But again, good job by these members of the secondary who are doing their job to step up and fill. And there he is, T.J. Scannell. I'm telling you, they can hear us. We might be in the press box, but I have a feeling that they can hear us on the field because every time we highlight someone, it just happens. Interception number two of the career for T.J. Scannell. Let's get another look at it. Phillips just looking for a man, and Scannell at the right place at the right time. It was a tip ball from Kennedy Stewart, the junior from the Woodlands, and it ends up in the hands of the Reagan Rattler. Coach Scannell, if you're listening, hope you're happy. Gives Trinity the ball right around midfield. And they'll snap what could be the final play of the quarter. But just an incredible job by a defense that, as good as they were last year, the interceptions really weren't there. As they look to have a rush at the end of the quarter, but the interceptions really weren't there. But as of late, they are really piling up three against Millsaps, one of them from Scannell in Jackson, Mississippi. And Scannell saying, one is not good enough. I need a second. And it'll send Trinity into the fourth quarter with a 38 to nothing lead. A dominant performance by the Trinity Tigers continues. You can see the stats on your screen. 335 yards of offense, the defense holding Swanee to 50. And we will stick around here as we head to the fourth quarter because I want to ask you something, Luke. Have you heard of the 1899 Swanee football team? I have not. I'm not nearly as well versed on the matter as I assume you are, Brian. Well, this matchup between Trinity and Swanee is one that really runs deep. There's some history there. Goes back all the way to the 70s. Trinity 26-4 and all time against the Swanee Tigers. But there was a time that the Swanee Tigers were basically the Alabama of college football. And you might be saying, no way. The Swanee Tigers, the Alabama of college football? Well, if you don't believe me, believe a poll in 2012 by the College Football Hall of Fame in which the Swanee Tigers of 1899 were voted as the greatest college football team of all time. But there has to be a reason for that, right? They must have done something pretty cool, Luke. You oh, think of course. So? Yeah. I, I can only imagine. Well, they, they did do something pretty cool. as a nice run here on the outside for Trinity. Gets them into Swanee territory. But those Swanee Tigers of 1899, known as the Iron Men, went 12-0, and outscoring opponents 322-10. to And who did they play? Well, the likes of Auburn, Alabama... But it gets better, not just 12-0, not just an onslaught of that margin of victory, but they hopped on a train and headed on the road and won five games in six days. And who did they beat? They beat Texas, Texas A&M, Tulane, LSU, and Ole Miss. And you heard me right, five wins in six days, and on the seventh day, they rested. That is the saying that can be heard around campus at Swanee. Five wins in six days against the best of the best in college football, and that's what has earned them the lore of the greatest college football team of all time. Yeah, Brian, and that's just one of the most unbelievable stats. Certainly, college football has come a long way, and it, it looks different today than it would have over 100 years ago, but no matter what you're playing, to go out to play five times in a matter of six days, it doesn't happen at any level in practically any sport that we cover. To do that in and of itself, to play that level of competition and to win all of those games, incredibly, incredibly impressive. And you talk about the fact that they were the Alabama of college football. They, Alabama is what Swanee was, right? You, you can flip it. Alabama is what exists today, but Swanee set the standard to begin with. You're absolutely right. Alabama is what Swanee was. And the connections continue because that was in 1899, that magical season. But Swanee football continued to dominate through the early part of the next century. And they were actually a founding member of the so Southeastern Conference, the SEC, 
the famous conference that you hear every Saturday, and you might hear the slogan, it just means more. Well, I don't think it means as much without Swanee there. But Swanee was there at the beginning. They were one of several schools who founded the Southeastern Conference, along with not only Alabama and Auburn, but the likes of Florida and Georgia and Tennessee. But they didn't have the greatest time in the SEC, if we're being honest. They went 0-37, did not win from 1933 to 1940. And so school leadership said, you know what? I think we've got to step away from giving scholarships in sports. As Ryan back wrapped up here in the backfield, Quinn Johnson. First time we've said that name with the sack to get the turnover on downs. But Swanee way back in the mid 1900s saying, I think we've got to focus on academics. Stop giving academic athletic scholarships. And they left the SEC. Now they're in the SAA. They were in the SEAC for a long time which is why Trinity and Swanee have played so much. But when you think Swanee, you think college football. Some really great history up there in Tennessee. Yeah, absolutely, Brian. And such a great tail end for a week in which we talked to Coach Urban. We talked about the games that have happened in the past couple of weeks. And we talked, of course, about this matchup that was coming against Swanee. But we talked about other things the likelihood of hosting a playoff game and one of the recent or more recent unfoldings as this one is hauled deep down the middle of the field and a nice job by Azariah Anderson as that one was a perfect delivery, but breaking that pass up, ultimately incomplete, breaking it down on the field for us. One of the things we talked about, of course, was the unfolding of some moves and some shifts in conferences and one of the biggest things that has happened is McMurray University in Abilene announced that they are going to rejoin the SCAC they're going to bring a football team with them some other members that are already within the SCAC including Shriner University Centenary University in Louisiana or excuse me Centenary College in Louisiana are going to resurrect football programs and now the SCAC is going to have the opportunity to have a football conference, right? It was previously existent. Teams moved out. Texas Lutheran, which is in the SCAC and other sports, now plays in the ASC conference in football. So a lot of movement, which would pull teams like Trinity out of the SAA and talking to Coach Urban about it, one of the emphasis that he placed on the conversation, on the idea, was the fact that he was really comfortable in the SAA, but he was really happy with the tradition that it provides. Teams that have played a lot over the history of this game of football. Trinity, as you mentioned, has obviously played Swanee a ton in the course of these two programs' histories. And for Swanee to have this type of tradition, this rich of a tradition, is certainly something that you would miss out on. Yeah, it's a rivalry that just goes back so long, along with that rivalry with Millsaps, for example. These two teams playing in Mississippi last year. Of course, everyone around here remembers the Mississippi miracle with Trinity winning that game I think 15 years ago now hard to believe one of the greatest calls I've ever heard but definitely would be a shame to lose some of those rivalries so it'll be very interesting to see what the developments are as Phillips takes a massive hit and it looks like it was Scannell again so TJ Scannell the first year linebacker we'll take a look at the replay as Phillips had some time initially, then was being chased down from behind, and it was number 34, Scannell, that brings up a second and nine. But it'll, it'll definitely be interesting to see how everything plays out. Nothing will immediately change, as all those schools that you mentioned adding football and bringing football, it'll all take a few years to actually happen and actually formalize itself. And so you never know what little tweaks there might be to some rules some conference members and we shall see but for now it is SAA for Trinity football the Southern Athletic Association and this Trinity Tiger team trying to wrap up their second consecutive SAA crown they already have a share of it but they want it to themselves 
and they are 11 minutes and 11 seconds. Perfect timing for that. 11-11, make a wish. I wish for an undefeated regular season for the Trinity Tigers. And very convenient that that 11-11 came in the fourth quarter for us today, Brian. Already up 38 to nothing. Are you saying the 11-11 wishes don't normally come true? Well, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying it's a little bit more likely at this point in the game. Maybe you feel a little bit more confident in making that wish now than you would have three quarters ago. I don't know. When I see this Trinity Tiger football team, I have complete trust in them being able to make it happen. With the football games that we have seen this year, you can never count them out. There were a couple times. We were up here. We were stressed. Everybody was stressed. No one knew that they would pull out that victory against Birmingham Southern. That game against Barry was a slog. The Vikings coming into town really slowing things down and nearly coming out with a victory. And of course, that Wheaton game way back at the beginning of the season. So much electricity can be felt back then, could be felt back then, could still be felt now when you think about that blocked extra point in overtime. The ups and downs, the thrills of this season. And if we're lucky, they are not done on Tiger Network. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right about that, Brian. You think about all of those moments, the faith that this team has, the confidence that they have in their own ability to go out and perform and to ultimately win games. I, they have this mindset in all of these scenarios through the coaching staff, through the players themselves, as that one is dropped by Osa down that right sideline, ultimately incomplete, but a nice deliverance from Phillips right there. Just a certain presence of mind and calmness in all of those situations. Wheaton coming back, driving down the field, kicking a 40-plus yard field goal to tie it and send it into overtime. But Trinity remained calm and ultimately came out with the win. Birmingham Southern with just over a minute left in the game to go up to score a touchdown to come back and on a fourth and five deliver a strike that ultimately was a game winner just the presence of mind being calm in all of those scenarios being calm in all of these games where Trinity has gotten everyone's best shot they've certainly established themselves here this season coming off a year where they went nine and oh to now when they are at the forefront of everyone's mind on both a national level, but also within the SAA, getting everyone's best shot in the conference schedule to set out to accomplish this goal, to have the presence of mind, and to ultimately really deliver in the end. Incredibly, incredibly impressive. Yeah, you really captured a, an important shift that I don't know if it's talked about enough. And it's that last year, Trinity seemingly was the underdog throughout the year. They were kind of shocking people. They went to Barry and beat a Barry team that almost never loses at home. As play is stopped here, time out Swanee, but Barry losing at home to Trinity never happens. Really kind of raised some eyebrows at the time, but then Trinity again having to go on the road, pulling off that stunner in Birmingham, and then they go to University of Mary Harden Baylor. Nobody thinks they're going to win there. They make it very close, give the Crusaders what ended up being their toughest challenge on their way to a national championship. So then going into this year, Trinity all of a sudden was the team to beat in the SAA and in the state of Texas, along with Mary Harden Baylor. And so, like you said, every team has given them their best shot. And every time Trinity has responded. Yeah, and you go back to that Barry game, going on the road in what I think was Trinity's first conference game in the conference schedule last year. And that in itself opened things up for the conference as a whole. You mentioned the fact that Barry doesn't lose at home. Barry just didn't lose very frequently in the SAA as a whole. I think last year was the first time in four or five conference champ campaigns that they weren't the champion and didn't receive that qualifying bid to the NCAA postseason. So last year, when Trinity went on the road to get that win, it certainly opened things up, but I'm not sure that they necessarily established themselves at that point in time as the favorite in the SAA. It took them all season long. It took them going into Birmingham to win on the road. But certainly, after a game like that last year, we're going to get the best shot of Birmingham Southern. We're going to get the best shot of Barry and Center, who went up 14 to nothing 
at home against this Trinity squad this year, but they showed the resilience, the persistence, and outscored center 41-7 to the rest of the way, and they continue to show it here this afternoon, even with this game in hand up 38 to nothing, getting after Phillips for another sack, Brian. I'm not sure how many that is this afternoon, but they're adding to a total that's definitely a year-over-year -year increase. Certainly have already doubled their total from last season, but another five or six this afternoon. You're right on the dot. A.J. Townsend with the sack. It is number six for the Trinity Tigers on the afternoon. And their average of 3.1 coming into today was already best in the conference and 24th best in Division Three. So now you're doubling up that average. I'd say it's one of the top marks in the country. Six in one game. Phillips looking, looking. Townsend chasing him down. Phillips continues to search on this fourth down well past the line of scrimmage with that throw. It is incomplete anyway. The penalty marker has come out just in case it would have been complete. But one way or another, it'll be Trinity Ball on the turnover. Yeah, Brian, and one thing I think is important to note is we get another great shot of Paul McGinley Field being set up. Kickoff in the NCAA Division Three Women's Tournament. That playoff going to get underway this evening couple of games here in San Antonio. I know Trinity taking on the Pomona Pitzer Sage Hens. It's going to be a rematch of a game that was played here in the tournament a season ago. So certainly expect emotions to be high in that one, Brian. Yeah, kickoff at 5 p.m. right there at Paul McGinley Field. And you heard us talk about how nice it feels outside. It is cold. It is crisp. And where else would you rather be than Paul McGinley Field at 5 p.m. if you can't make it? We'll have it on Tiger Network as well. But Trinity Women's Soccer, another outstanding campaign during the regular season, unblemished, and they will look to defend their undefeated record tonight against those hate Sage Hens. As Trinity's offense takes the field yet again, and this time it is not Ryan back. It is a new name out there for the Trinity Tigers. Daz Thomas, the first year from Houston, comes in with just about eight minutes to go in the fourth quarter. Yeah, and Brian, another name that we've had the opportunity to call this season, but it's been a while. Just like Ryan Back, it's been a while since we've had the opportunity to get these second and third stringers into the games. But based on conversations we've had with Coach Herbin, the talent persists. And we see it right here immediately as he's making something happen with his legs and getting back to the middle of the field, refusing to go down right here. A really strong run, obviously escaping, eluding pressure in the backfield, avoiding the sack, and then attacking the middle of the field, not being satisfied with just scampering out of bounds. And a nice gain right there for a true freshman who comes in and there's a ton of talent in this quarterback room, Brian. It's a good issue to have, it seems like. It is a great issue to have. Just the third appearance for the first year, Thomas. Saw some play at Millsaps, went three for three. So has a 100% completion rate there. This time he hands it off to Jackson Williams on the first down run. Thomas also came in against TLU. We were here on the broadcast on Tiger Network for that. But now the third quarterback getting some action for the Trinity Tigers. Against the Swanee Tigers. You may have caught that we've called Swanee Swanee for the most part. But the official name of the university is the University of the South. But they are commonly known as Swanee. As Thomas is back to pass plenty of time here against Swanee. Now might choose to run again. And he does, but he is wrapped up by Quinn Johnson. Quinn Johnson has really been a one-man wrecking crew for the Tigers this year. Leads the team in tackles, sacks, tackles for a loss. And he is near the top of the conference. And you'll see the replay here that he wrapped up Thomas on the edge. But I was curious, as I so often am ahead of these games, trying to learn as much about the opponent as possible, 
And I was just wondering, why are they sometimes known as Swanee, and why are they sometimes known as the University of the South? Well, the University of South is the official name, but it is located in Sewanee, Tennessee. And the reason that it's called Sewanee, Tennessee is because the plot of land that was given to the university, as this pass drops incomplete, was given to the university by the Swanee Mining Company because the land is located on formerly Native American territory that was called Swanee, which means Southern in the Shawnee Native American language. So Swanee equals Southern in the Shawnee language. And it makes sense. The University of the South, Swanee, also known as Southern, it all connects. Very, very interesting, Brian. And I think one aspect of the broadcast that we haven't talked about as much this year as we have done for other sports is our discussion of university mascots. And while not exactly along the lines, as that one, just a knuckleball that, while it had the strength and kind of had a chance, ultimately fell short of that crossbar. And that was Tyler Weddle, who we mentioned earlier in the game on that kickoff return, making the play along that far sideline. So a new name, fresh face, Blake Lynn, usually taking care of the business on the extra points and some shorter field goals, but not sure if that's a circumstantial up 38 to nothing attempt or if that's a choice by the coaching staff on a little bit of a longer field goal to give Weddle the try instead of Blake Lynn. But back to the information that you shared with us, Brian, certainly something that I have missed got the opportunity to talk about Wheaton College and their mascot, but again, impressing me with your research abilities and what you found out about the University of the South. It's definitely my favorite part. I love watching the games. I love meeting the people, but there's just something so fun about finding those little tidbits about the schools, about the mascots, and since this was a Tiger versus Tiger matchup, I didn't find the mascot itself as interesting as the name Swanee and the University of the South. So my efforts were kind of focused there. But you never know what you'll learn on Tiger Network. That's the beauty of it, isn't it? It's a little bit of a history lesson. You do a good job. It's the liberal arts here at Trinity. And exactly. That's, that's the new segment we need. We didn't need a, a hat fall off counter. We needed history. We needed a history segment with Brian, liberal arts We'll, we'll brainstorm. We have another game, we hope, here in San Antonio. We'll brainstorm, maybe have some ideas, maybe get some feedback in the comment section next week, or maybe even some ideas of your own, if you're listening at home, for what we need to call Brian's informational segments. Yeah, and it also allows me to kind of tease a story that I'm working on in written form, but I'll also be able to talk about it as Trinity's defense gets another big stop here on third down. But we, you've heard us say those chains are moving, right, on first downs. Well, we found out that there are two very special people moving those chains. Maybe a couple of physics professors, could it be? Well, I won't tell you too much. Don't want to give it all away. And we're hoping to have another broadcast. So I'm really, really putting a lot on the line here of not telling you the story. But just know that those people moving those chains are not just anybody. They're some physics professors and just goes to show the nature of the liberal arts here. At Trinity, it goes from the physics classroom to the football field. Yeah, certainly a tight-knit group on the field that this football team is. But even in the physics department, some bonding going on. I know a little bit about this, Brian. I've seen some tweets circulating so i am intrigued to see what you have for us certainly be keeping an eye out for that story i'll let all of you know when it's ready it'll be published and it will be talked about on tiger network in one way or another we will find a way to talk about it as there's only 326 left in the fourth quarter trinity up 38 to 0 over swanee and the third option at quarterback des thomas in there Electing to run again. Look at those legs. Look at that speed. He makes it look easy out there. Gets the first down and puts the Tigers near the red zone. And say, look to put a ribbon on this one. And we mentioned it earlier. 
that this could be the kickoff to a very special day for the Trinity Tigers and the football team doing its part. And now we'll send it over in just a few hours. And perfect timing, I actually see women's soccer head coach Dylan Harrison climbing the stairs here. So one of the best things that you have here at Trinity is the team supporting each other. We see it constantly at Calgard Gym. The football team goes to support volleyball. Volleyball was out here at the Hall of Fame induction a couple of weeks ago. And a nice spin here on the outside run. Trinity continuing to get some positive yardage. But from here, we will kick it over to Paul McGinley Field at 5 p.m. And then at 7 p.m., Trinity Volleyball will look to beat the undefeated Claremont Mud Scripps Athenas. We are on the edge of our seats, aren't we, Luke? Very oh, nervous for that one. Absolutely. It's something that I think both of us have known and expected all along, Brian, is that matchup. It will be a good one. Kicks off at 7 p.m. Central Time. Have another run for Trinity. And that last snap taken by Eli Gaiman, it looks like, wearing 15 or... Is it a new quarterback as well? There's multiple freshman quarterback that have come into that room. Des Thomas, one of the two true freshmen wearing number four. Number 15, though, Mar Marcus Vondrak from just up the road, went to St. Michael's High School in Austin, Texas, taking the snaps in the first of his college career. So he'll hand the ball off again right there. And as you mentioned, Brian, the clock continued to wind down here in San Antonio, just 121 left. So I'm not sure if he'll have the opportunity to put the ball in the air in his first season here at Trinity. But certainly good to see him getting into the mix, getting some action on the field now. Yeah, and apologize for thinking that's Gaiman, but I know Gaiman did do a lot in his high school career. So wouldn't be shocked at this point to see him take some snaps, but... Like you corrected, it is another first year out there. We'll see if he does get a throw. Another handoff. Bouncing around there near the five, and he will be brought down. Bradley Jones there, the first year from College Station, Texas. Probably a lot happier to be in San Antonio this college football season than College Station. So much good college football happening. Maybe not in College Station, but in the Bronx. Good thing Yankee Stadium finally sees some talent on the field as Cortland against, against Ithaca. And did you say 40,000 watching that game, Luke? Yeah. I'm not sure what the exact figure is, Brian, but I saw that it's at least 40,000 in Yankee Stadium watching one of the best rivalry games in all of college football. And I think they've set what is the second highest attendance total for a football game in all of Division Three history. So we've talked about what this season has looked like, all of the great matchups that are going on today. But then rivalries like that just add to the lore. And you mentioned if you weren't familiar with Division Three football for whatever reason, but you've now come into the fold, there is a lot going on and a lot to pay attention to. But it's all incredibly, incredibly entertaining, and it's keeping us on the edges of our seat as things will continue into tomorrow as decisions will be made about who's making it to the postseason, who's going to have the opportunity to play in Week 12 one week from today. A lot of good college football everywhere, but it is hard to find a place where it has been better then San Antonio, Texas. The clock hit zero, and the Trinity Tigers, for the second consecutive year, undefeated in the regular season. A perfect 10-0 record, wrapped up with a beautiful 38-0 victory over their SAA rival, Suwanee. And for the first time since 1997, 8 and 9, the Tigers have consecutive undefeated seasons. Unreal accomplishment that will go down in the history books. And you've been witness to it here on Tiger Network. 414 yards of total offense. So many contributed from the first touchdown of Justin Carmouche to the electrifying punt return touchdowns 
of B.J. Stewart. It's hard to really point to one person, Luke. It continues to be a team effort for Trinity. Yeah, and that's, I think, what we've grown to expect, Brian. Just so many facets of the game that they take so seriously. And I think what stands out time and time again, now that we've moved into this role, have become close to this team, pay such close attention, is the way that special teams factor into things in the long run. You mentioned B.J. Stewart, who was absolutely stellar today, but it's been the case all season long. It's been the case across both years, just the emphasis that Coach Urban puts on that group and what it can do, how it can change a game, has been really interesting to see. The seniors will get to sing the alma mater one more time. We'll let you listen in, but don't go anywhere. We'll wrap it up right after Wyatt Bush leads the chorus, and it looks like here comes the conductor, Amir Mustafa. So listen in to the Trinity alma mater. Welcome back to Trinity's Football Stadium. Beautiful rendition of the alma mater. May not have seen it. The wind was howling so much that we mentioned it at the top of the broadcast that made the field mics unusable for that part of the broadcast. But we promise you that Amir Mustafa and Wyatt Bush did an excellent job. And Mustafa always does. And a special surprise we saw at the end, Luke, Jeremy Urban, the Gatorade Shower recipient. And if you don't believe us, you'll see a couple of people standing right around that 50-yard line. You can see the ice still on the field here in San Antonio. And we already mentioned a little bit colder, so I'm sure Coach Urban was a huge fan of being doused after that win. But I'm sure he is satisfied no matter what with the performance here this afternoon. Certainly a statement win, 38 to nothing over Swanee University of the South. A great conclusion as we've talked about all day long, to a second consecutive undefeated regular season. But things will not be done this week. Already qualified for the NCAA playoffs. So selection show tomorrow in the evening will ultimately decide what happens, whether they will host or who they will play in the playoffs, Brian. It will be a good one. We will have our eyes tuned in to the selection show as you get another excellent look at Coach Urban leading his Tiger football team. He told us this senior day was going to be special no matter what, and he mentioned a saying that Coach Steve Moore was implementing around here when he was in charge, when he was Coach Urban's coach, and he said, you'll always remember your first and your last. And for many of these Tiger football players, this will be the final home game because even if they do host a playoff game, that condensed roster will not allow every single person to dress out. So for some of these Tigers, the final time they will suit up at home. So congratulations to them, a senior class that has now officially gone 19-0 in the last two regular seasons. 
Finished 10-0 this year, 7-0 in conference play, a top five ranking. And what's next? Only time will tell. We will find out tomorrow who the Tigers will face and where they will face them. But for now, two and a half hours, you've got time to get stuff done. But you better be on Tiger Network or at Paul McGinley Field to watch women's soccer. And then we will all collectively tune in to Trinity Volleyball at 7 p.m. It's been a magical season, and we hope it continues for everyone involved, the camera the camera crew, the graphics, the stats, everything that you see on your screen. There is someone running it. It's been so fun to bring it to you all year, Luke. And it just continues to get better and better. The drone shots, the replays, the different angles, we always try to improve, and we're so thankful to everyone involved. So... For Luke Terry, I'm Brian Yenselson, and we hope to see you next week.